Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love, your life, and your light that you successfully, successfully got to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for this spiritual family, this community of faith called Christian Cultural Center. Thank you for churches across the country and around the world who are celebrating your triumph, your victory today. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for your commitment to us to see us grow, develop, experience, the use of our gift, talents, and abilities, and make a difference while we're here on this planet. Once again, we ask you to touch our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive the wisdom and instruction of your word. For you sent that word to heal us and to deliver us from our destruction. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, greet three people before you're seated. Bless them in the name of the Lord. Okay. I'm checking my clock because we got to finish this today. It can't be a part four. This is part three. But before we jump in, and, and I want to unpack some things for you, okay? Before we do, uh, before we do, <coughs> some announcements. Uh, Good Friday service begins at sunrise in our sunrise service on Friday morning. We will be here at the Brooklyn and Long Island campus having sunrise service Good Friday at 6 a.m. So if you plan to be with us for Good Friday morning, we definitely want to make sure that you're aware of the time and the locations. We will be having a Good Friday evening service as well at both the Brooklyn and Long Island campus, and that will begin at 8 p.m. And you've been asked to wear black. Don't ask me why. I can think of many reasons for the occasion, but they have something incredibly planned for you. So that's Friday evening, Good Friday service in the evening uh, at both Brooklyn and Long Island campus at 8 p.m. Resurrection Sunday services will be here at Christian Cultural Center and will at the Brooklyn campus, all three campuses, but at the, this campus, we will be having two services, one at 8 a.m. and the other at 11 a.m. So you have a choice of services to come to. And in Long Island, at the Orlando campus, will be at the usual time of 10 a.m. So we have two services next Sunday here at the Brooklyn campus. Any questions? Good. I'm glad that you were able to get this. Today is Palm Sunday. And usually... The preachers, the pastors will preach about Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday. But there is enough access to information that you can look it up. <laughs> and find out what it's really all about. But indeed, we do carry the tradition of celebrating Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Where the crowds cried, Hosanna to the son of David. It was that which launched Passion Week that would result in his death on the cross. But how many know it didn't stop on Good Friday? The end result is Resurrection Sunday. So traditionally, we hand out palms. Uh, we don't hand them out looking like this. That's on you. 
So you can do whatever you want with it and turn it and twist it and then apply this on the wall over your bed. <laughs> and you will be protected till next year when we do it again. There's no superpower in this. It is a symbol. It is a symbol. The power is in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the power is. Amen? All right. So, are you ready? Lawlessness, part three. As I thought about the mention last week, and it was a mention of what's happening in the Middle East, in, in Gaza, to put in perspective the turmoil. I felt that even in wrapping this up on lawlessness, I need to revisit that very quickly because I want to give you a framework for it. I want to give you the bigger picture. Because the conflict between, and I'm being very specific with my words, very intentional with my words, the conflict between the state of Israel and Hamas has been interpreted many different ways. And it has added to the already existing divisions and polarizations that exist in our nation, the United States. And people are picking and choosing sides, determining who the oppressor is, who the oppressed are, without any rules or guidelines to make those kind of decisions. So often they're random, they're contrary, and often without the bigger picture, without context. I shared with you that this division has caused people to, here in the United States, align with the Palestinian and what is called the plight of the Palestinians because of the number of deaths. And you have others who have aligned with the nation of Israel, the state of Israel, especially within uh, dispensationalist evangelical movements who subscribe to a theology that the relationship with Israel, with the United States is critical because of biblical prophecy. And even with that, it's not because there is a support of Israel as a, uh, a nation state, but because prophetically they believe that Israel will ultimately, as an entire society, be converted to Christianity. So there are all of these factors and ideas and interpretations that are shaping and influence the way people think. We've had protests in favor of the Palestinians, we've had protests against the Palestinians, we've had a rise of anti-Semitism. This is not new. And the passage of scripture that I wanted to highlight where it speaks of lawlessness is found in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24 verse 12. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. All speak prophetically of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem itself, the scattering of the Jewish people into all the nations of the earth, and to use the language of Luke, they would be scattered until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The language, the times of the Gentiles, simply speaks of Gentile rule, especially as it is exacted over the nation of Israel. Because when Jesus spoke these words, the Jewish people were being occupied by the Roman Empire. Jesus said in those passages, and I specifically spoke to the dating of God, Mike Mark's gospel because of those who want to challenge the prophetic legitimacy of Luke 
and Matthew's gospel because they were both written after 69 and 70 AD when the actual destruction of the temple and Jerusalem took place by the Roman army. The reason why that war took place is because from the time of Jesus' death right up to that destruction of the temple, there were insurrections after insurrections by the Jewish people. There were zealots. There were movements pushing back against Roman occupation. And it got to the point where the Roman government said, enough, we're going to send military force in there. It was not the intent to take it as far that it, as it went, but the resistance that the Roman soldiers and military experienced turned into an all-out conflict where the city of Jerusalem was burned and the temple was destroyed. In the Gospel of Mark, which was written between 60 and 69 to 70 AD, it was predicted where Jesus said, there shall not be left here, speaking of the temple complex, one stone left upon another. I shared with you last week the epistles of the Apostle Paul and how Paul's writings to Rome, to the, to the church at Rome and Corinth and Ephesus and Colossians, all right, was all written before the actual destruction of the temple. In fact, Paul's writings predated Mark's gospel. So Paul's testimony, not quoting Jesus, but expounding on the fact that the end of the Jewish sacrificial religious system was necessary in order for the New Testament and the sacrifice of Jesus to be fully realized by the Jewish people. Because as long as that sacrificial system was in place, it competed with Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice for the reconciliation of mankind with God and the cleansing of our sins. So for that 40-year period, there was a tension. And that's why when you read the book of Acts, you will find conflict between those who have embraced Jesus and are still struggling with the law. How do we make that transition? So Paul's writings were critical to let us know that there had to be the destruction of the temple. There had to be because there had to be the total cessation of that sacrificial religious system. And of course, the Jewish people shifted things and began to celebrate in a different way to this day. That was important. Continuing in that text, Jesus made statements like, nation shall rise against nation. The Greek word ethnos, from where we get ethnicity, which was the original primary identification of people, not by race and color of their skin, which is a social construct that came along some 1,500 years later. He said kingdom which in the Greek is basileia, which means rule and dominion. Kingdom would rise against kingdom. And these words are very, very important. Prophetically, as Jesus said, this is what's going to happen because they asked him, well, when will the destruction of the temple take place? When will the collapse of Jerusalem take place? What will be the sign of your return? And he began to go through a series of signs that would signal his return. And amongst those signs were nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In other words, the competition for resources, power, and influence between national entities and ethnic groups 
would continue right up to his second coming. That will be a reality. And when I, when I, when I reflect on that, I have to say it makes sense because he said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? Hallowing the name of Yahweh as the ultimate authority over human society is where it begins. And then he said, pray this. Little King James language, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Please understand the implications here. He is talking about praying for the consolidation of all earthly powers under one authority. Revelation put it this way. The kingdoms of this world have become. The kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And why is that important? I'm glad you asked. Because unless there is a consolidation of all kingdoms and nations, there will never be a common authority. Did you hear what I'm just saying to you? There won't be a, let me write it on the board, a common sovereignty. What is a common sovereignty? It is an ultimate authority that everyone submits to. Because only when there is a common sovereignty do we then share the same values and order. Very important. This term common sovereignty. The word anarchy. When we hear that word, we see that word, we think immediately of what? Chaos and confusion. But it really means anarchy. Which literally means the absence of government. So whenever there's the absence of government, it results in chaos. It results in disorder. It results in confusion. Because the purpose for government is to maintain order. To protect the peace. To restrain evil. God created government. People created politics. And that's why in the realm of politics, which people create and identify based upon certain agendas or certain beliefs about the way society should be organized, we have all of these political parties and conflicts of opinion. And then they each recruit people to agree with them. Next thing you know, you got Republicans, you got Democrats, you got liberals, you got left, you got right, you got center, you got independents, you got libertarians, and it goes on and on and on. Before World War I, we still had the residual of empires in the world, and, and, and Europe was essentially the, the, the center of power. But with World War I and then World War II, which was actually a continuation of World War I, everything changed. World War I saw the collapse of the German Empire, the Austrian Empire, the Russian Empire. And they were the last because empire, which is really 
dominating the earth with one particular power, that was last realized with the Roman Empire. But you had these small, smaller empires. And after World War I, with the collapse of these smaller empires, we now experience the idealization of the world. In other words, ideologies took over. All the isms that we know today moved into place. I'm going to keep this pedestrian. World War II put a seal on it. And the power, the center of power, shifted from Europe to the West. Primarily the United States. And when you got an atomic bomb, you got some reasons for the power to shift in your direction. But now there's the emergence in Europe of what is called a block, a grouping of nations under a particular ideology, which was called the Soviet Union. And some of y'all are too young to even know what the USSR even means. But some of us have been around for a while. We remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, when you had Kennedy and Khrushchev facing off, and the threat of nuclear war we were faced with. That is called Cold War. Cold War is where you have two superior powers facing off with each other, or you have two blocks of nations under a particular ideology facing off. The Soviet Union continued, of course, until 1990 when it collapsed and Russia emerged again. And of course, Putin's objective is to resurrect the Soviet Union, the USSR, but not as a Soviet bloc, but as one empire, the Russian Empire. Cold War is fought through proxy wars because the superpowers know they don't want to go at each other. That would be cataclysmic. That would be destructive to the entire earth. So they, fall, they fight smaller wars through proxy wars like the Ukraine. Are you hearing me, folks? So when you think of the state of Israel, and we have to make a distinction between the state of Israel as a nation state and the Jewish people. That's another theological discussion. Not today. Because we don't want to run out of time. So, cold wars are fought by proxy wars. So now it's talking about, you, you have to think about allies. Who's with you and who's against you. And you want to create alliances. Are you with me? And you create, you create alliances often with people that you don't necessarily agree with their policies and their practices. So just because you create a strategic alliance doesn't mean you align with all the policies and practices of the nation that you are creating the alliance with. This is important, it's important. Because unless you see the nation of Israel as a strategic alliance with the United States, because of an emerging Cold War in the Middle East, then you won't understand why that relationship is important and you reduce it to the ground level. And let me say this to you, I feel for any loss of human life, whether Palestinian or Israeli or any other label. Because I subscribe as a Christian to the Imago Dei and that is every human being is made in the image of God.
regardless of their social, economic, racial context, it doesn't matter, and they're worthy of dignity, worthy of respect. And that's what we're supposed to do as people of faith, as spiritual authorities and moral authorities. We elevate the conversation above the arguments that are taking place on the ground to a place of higher understanding, which is the life and dignity of every human person. Very important. But I want you to see the backdrop of all of this because we go back to this thing called common sovereignty. So anarchy is the absence of what? Government. Essentially the absence of a common sovereignty. So the way the world is constructed right now, it's anarchic because there is no common sovereignty on this planet. Are you hearing me? And this is why you got to understand when Jesus said, pray thy kingdom come. What is he saying? He's saying, we're praying for a common sovereignty under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Who we believe is the incarnation of the invisible God who brings to us ultimate reality. So in the absence of a common sovereignty, what do nations do? They establish their own sovereignty. So we have America. We have Great Britain. We have France. We have Russia. We have Spain. We have Germany. We have Australia. And I can go on and on and on. So instead of one common sovereignty, we have each national entity establish its own authority, its own sovereignty. Which simply says, we tell ourselves what to do. You don't tell us what to do. Got it? Very important. Now, in the absence of a common sovereignty, something else has to go into play. And coming out of World War I, 70 million lives were lost. Do you hear that? 70 million lives with these two wars. And so coming out of that, what the national, international community realized, we have to have something called balance of power. There has to be a way to keep one nation from becoming so powerful that it can dominate the rest of the world and establish its own sovereignty as the common sovereignty and universal rule. This is what Hitler was all about. Mussolini was inspired by the same ideas. World conquest to establish their ideology as sovereign over the earth. So the international community said, no, 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 you can't do that. We have to have something to balance power. So how do you balance power? You create alliances. So the United States allies with, with France and, and, and with Germany and, and, well, now Germany after the fact, and Great Britain. And how many understand how that works? And then, and then you, you, you have Australia come in and then Russia allies with China and China. So now you're, 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 you're balancing the power out so that no one group or individual nation, because although the United States has been a superpower since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990, all right, China has emerged incredibly as a power to be reckoned with. And because it's a communist government, they don't have to have a Hakeem Jeffries. They just tell you what to do. Here we engage the people and give the people a voice. In China, the government makes its own decisions and that's law. That's it. How many understand what I'm talking about here? So the international community said, we have to have things in place so that this doesn't happen again. And we lose this kind of life and the planet is threatened. So we need a balance of power. 
something else in the backdrop. Something called the international system. What is the international system? You keep asking the right questions this morning. Let me commend you, students. And please, I don't say, I came to church to learn about Jesus. If you don't see the relationship between Jesus and all of this, then your Jesus is too small to save you. Easier, easy, look. All authority has been given to me, he said, both in heaven and on earth. It bothers me, the theology that paints God as someone that we summon. As someone who appears and disappears when we summon him. No, he's in charge. He's at work whether you prayed this morning or not. And thank God that he is. But we painted him into some genie in a bottle that we robbed. And our, our wish is his command. I don't want that type of a God. I want a God who's smarter than me. Who knows more than me. In fact, I want a God who is omnipotent. Omniscient. Omnipresent. Not a God who has love, but a God who is love. I don't want a God who has life. I want a God who is life. Which means he's the source of it all. Don't turn my Jesus into some cheesy little God that you tack up on your wall over your bed for Palm Sunday. He is the cosmic ruler of the universe with all things subjected to him. All powers, social institutions, economic systems. And he is at work moving human society in a specific direction. That's my Jesus. So there has to be two things at work without a common sovereignty, without one government in charge. Because the kingdom of God is the government of God. You have to have a balance of power, and that comes through alliances. You have to have allies. Do you know how we got the approval to build? Allies. In every sector necessary, whether it's government, education, finance. Individuals who align themselves with our vision and were willing to support that vision. Oh, yeah, for our I, congressman, I'm going to pick on you because you're here today. For, for the congressman to get things done and move through Congress, he has to have what? Allies. For you to get things done, guess what you have to have on a personal level? Allies. It's the way the world works. But it must also have an international system. And the international system is made up of treaties. Where we sit down to the table and the nations, representatives, all the presidents and prime ministers and kings get together. And they say, look, we're going to agree on certain rules governing what happens in the international community. Because we don't want one person to be a bully. And go into Ukraine. I'm sorry. We've got to have agreements that we ally around and are willing to go to war together if necessary, if it is compromised. 
You have to have NGOs, which are non-governmental organizations and institutions at work on the ground. I'm not going to go through all of the international system, but here's the, the big one. You have to have trade. And that's a big influencer. Got to understand. It's a big influencer. And if you, if you take what's happening in the Middle East, nation of Israel, the Palestinians, all God, you take all that and you put it against the backdrop of this, you understand that there's a lot more going on than just a conflict on the ground. And this is a big one. Trade. Say trade. Trade. Trade is about economics. Hey. And when you, I, we don't have the time to go through this because I'm not trying to teach you political systems here. But, but this backdrop is critical to your perspective and putting things in perspective. Because this is what explains the reality that the United States complains, you hear it on the media, the news, everything. You know, China is a threat to the United States. Oh my God, China. In fact, if there's a flu, it flew in from China. No matter what it is, China did it. That's America. I mean, you understand what I'm talking about. But here's what you got to understand. Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me make it worse. Can I? Yes. The United States is concerned, and I shared this about a month ago, it's concerned about Chinese hackers commissioned by the government who are seriously trying to hack in to our systems, our water system, our electrical grid, our power systems, oil, gas systems. They're trying to hack in. And here's the reality. There are 50 Chinese hackers to one FBI cyber specialist. Talk about the balance of power. And you can do that when you're in Chinese government because people are working for you. And they're not going to complain they ain't getting enough money. Let's raise, we need to raise the minimum wage here. Comrade. That's the reality. China is a threat. China is a power. And at the same time, when my wife orders from Amazon, I lift the boxes from the front door, bring them into the house, sit them there with her name, Karen Bernard, Karen Bernard, Karen Bernard, Karen Bernard, Karen Bernard, Karen Bernard, Karen Bernard. And as I sort through the boxes, made in China, made in China, made in China, made in China, made in When she discovered she didn't have to go to the store to shop, it was all over. Made where? So when economic systems are at stake and there's trade, people won't go to war, nations won't go to war because they don't want to mess up the trade. So right now, China is building its own cars, establishing its own plants. And don't you think for one minute that they're saying, boy, it's going to be great. Chinese people are going to love having these cars. No, they're thinking, those American consumers? Because mm. you know those Americans, they're materialists. They want buy everything. They just, and we make cars. For you, and you, and you, and you, riding around in your Toyota. So don't think for 
one minute. Don't get caught up in what's happening on the ground and then take sides. And no offense to this generation of our young people, but unfortunately your, your historical perspective is short. You've got to go back a couple thousand years to understand what's going on in the Middle East. And see, that's why Jesus says, and our gospel preaches, that there will be no peace on earth until we establish one common sovereignty. That's a scary notion. Are oh, you understand what I'm talking about? Now, did you get this? Any questions? Good. Let's move on. You're doing good this morning. Now think about common sovereignty, the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is not just the rule of Christ. It's a way society should be organized. The, and the best way to live in it. Now we have to be careful. Because you can't just pick up the Bible. You know... <laughs> I'm not going to call any name, but a dear friend of mine used to say, the Bible is a manual for life. If the Bible is a manual for life, it's the worst manual that was ever created. Because a manual should tell you exactly how something was created, how it should function. Are you with me? And what to do if it breaks down? No, the Bible is not that. It gives us philosophy, psychology, moral order, spiritual evaluation, an understanding of natural law, reason, and divine revelation. It is filled with so many different things. Lawlessness. Let's go to the text. Let's get it on the screen. Matthew 24, 12. And am I... See, that clock says zero. You know, you become in my amen corner. I'm going to have to shift your seat a little closer here. <laughs> we got to get this done. Next week is Easter, right? So in Matthew 24, 12, what does Jesus say? He says, and because what? Lawlessness will be what? Increased. The love of many will grow cold. Notice the connection that he makes between lawlessness and love. I'm going to make that connection. But first, what's lawlessness? Lawlessness is rebellion against divine authority and divine order. Specifically for us in our Christian tradition, is rebellion against the Lordship of Yahweh who revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So when you think about lawlessness, you're thinking about what? One word, what? Rebellion. Come on, say it to me. Rebellion. Rebellion against what? Divine authority and divine order. It's not just God having the authority, but also rebellion against how he States society should be organized. What the moral and spiritual construct should be. And that's why when Jesus was challenged uh, uh, about divorce, if you remember in, in Matthew chapter 19, you know, they said, well, if, if divorce is, 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 is not allowed, not permissible, not the ideal, why did Moses give a writing of divorcement? And Jesus' response was, it was a concession. Why? Those are my words. It was a concession. Simply, he said, <laughs> excuse me, because of the hardness of your hearts. Yeah. Yeah. Moses gave a writing of divorcement because of fallen human nature that fails to understand the covenant of marriage. And this purpose that it serves. He gave a concession. He allowed for divorce. But in the beginning, it was not so. 
So Jesus' reference point is not the present condition of society to legitimize it or justify it or follow the prescriptions of the culture. It's reaching back to the original intent in the mind of God. That's what we represent. And that's a problem for some folks who would like to order it differently. They'd like to rearrange some things. But you see, who knows best how something should function than the one who created it? <laughs> you didn't create this, you're going to come along and tell me how it should work. I don't think so. Rebellion against divine authority. Rebell rebellion against divine order. It is a disregard for the moral and ethical principles upon which the universe is built. Did you hear what I just said? It is rebellion. It's a disregard for the moral and ethical principles on, upon which the universe is built. The Apostle Paul said, when the Gentiles, those who don't have the law, do by nature the things written in the law, they prove that there is a universal law written on every human heart. So, so lawlessness is a rebellion. <laughs> and lawlessness manifests itself in religious systems, social systems, political systems, and the big one, ideologies. Boy, we're in a conflict with ideologies. This is how lawlessness shows up. Even in religious systems, political systems, social systems. Because these are all about the role that guidelines should play. It affects policy, moral codes, social institutions individual identities, on and on and on. And I know I'm talking fast, so listen fast. <laughs> to show you how lawlessness has infiltrated us, right? We live in a world that glamorizes and popularizes the worst of human nature. When you turn on TV, you go to the movies, you, all, all of these platforms, what's going on? We are glamorizing and popularizing the worst of human nature. And if you try to present the best of human nature, you're corny. You are irrelevant. You don't know what's going on. And I like this one. You're not being real. Who told you that fallen human society and all of its manifestation is what's real? That's the counterfeit. What's real is what comes from God. That is ultimate reality. That's real love, not counterfeit love. Let me, let, me, let me say this to you, because what does lawlessness and love have to do with each other? Simple. No, it's not that simple. It's complex. But I'm presenting to you in simple terms. When Jesus was asked by the religious leaders who wanted to trap him, there are 633 commandments in the law of Moses. How many? Thank you. And Jesus was asked, he said, so tell us. Which is the most important commandment? They were setting him up. Right? But his answer was brilliant. And he took it from the Old Testament. He said, the first is the greatest. You shall love the Lord your God. Come on, come on. You shall what? Come on. Love the Lord your God with all your, come on, what? Heart, 
mind, soul, strength, the totality of your being, you should love God. And then he said, the second one, which works with the first, he said, come on, you should love your neighbor as yourself. If I didn't understand that loving God deals with my self-love, then I wouldn't be too quick for somebody to love me the way they love themselves, because I don't know how you're loving you. You may, be, you may have a sick, warped understanding of what self-love is all about. I don't want to get caught up in that. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking about somebody you know. So the connection is critical. Because when you love God, you learn how to love. If you're loving him with the totality of your being, not if you're loving him with your own agenda. So when the vertical relationship is right, the horizontal relationship will follow. What was he saying? What holds humanity together to create cohesion, understanding, cooperation, respect, dignity, purpose, meaning, is when that humanity is ruled, which is the desire to benefit the one loved at the expense of self. It is not driven by greed. Love desires to give. Lust desires to get. And fallen humanity is driven not by love that comes from God, but lust. Self-preservation whether it's on an individual level or whether it's on the level of empire or a nation, fighting for resources, positioning themselves in positions of power and influence, dominating. So he said, when lawlessness increases, the love of many will grow cold. And we're seeing that. We are turning our face to what's going on in our society. When we're on the street and there's a homeless person, we step over them. We do what Jesus talked about in the Samaritan story. We cross the street. Because we don't want to get our hands dirty. Love continues to grow cold which means it affects every aspect of human relationship. He said it's a sign. So as you see more rebellion against order and moral principles and spiritual principles, Dr. King brought America to its knees with moral authority. Not economic power, with moral authority. And when Jesus said, behold, I give you power, what was he, what was he talking about? He didn't drop a check on us. He was talking about spiritual and moral authority because out of spiritual and moral authority, it influences politics. It influences, come on, social system. It influences economic systems. But we, we haven't understood that. Love of God and love of neighbor. That's where it is. And we're seeing the symptoms of a society whose love is growing cold. And we're seeing people suffer from a deficiency of empathy. It used to be walk a mile in my shoes, you've got nothing to lose. Now, that's on you. And we're seeing it play out in ways that we never imagined civil society would allow these kind of things to happen. There's more I could say, but I think I said a lot, and I said enough, and I think you get the idea. What's the bigger point? 
The Bible is relevant. Don't tell me that going to church, Jesus and the Bible is irrelevant to what's going on in my society. No, the problem is your ignorance. And notice, ignorance is a lack of knowledge. I didn't say stupidity. Stupidity is when you get the knowledge and ignore it. And that's why the church is important. Because this is the place where we're taught, where we're educated, where we're given understanding as part of our worship experience. We don't come in here just to feel good or to be entertained. You may be entertained in the process, but that's not the goal and objective. It's to empower you to be salt and to be light in a society. Because as I told you two weeks ago, stop standing on the sidelines and cursing the darkness. If darkness is the absence of light, then it's on us. I'm going to give you time to marinate that in your mind. We need to step up. Let's all stand. I get frustrated. Some of my colleagues were just trying to build the biggest church. What good is the biggest church if you haven't done anything? I tell them when I'm talking to pastors, I said, I said, listen, if here's how you know that you're doing the work of the Lord. If your church closes down tomorrow and nobody misses you, you failed. But if your church closes down and it creates a crisis in the community that you serve, you were doing your job. Yes. Slap high five with three people. Tell them I got that word today. Come on, give Jesus a good round of applause. Give God some praise. Did you get a word? Did you get a word? Act like manna from heaven came down and blessed your soul. Hallelujah. Well, I think we got it all in there as much as we can get. Thank you for your love for truth. Thank you for this season where we celebrate the greatest triumph, and that is God over sin, sickness, disease, and death through one solitary soul, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love you, family. Happy Palm Sunday. God bless. Can we just take a moment to give God praise? We close every service by saying that Jesus is Lord, but we can't do that without giving someone the opportunity to make him Lord. When lawlessness is increased, the love of many will grow cold. When false prophets rise up, they will lead many astray. When nation rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, there will be a demand that we choose sides. But Yahweh is our ultimate authority, and his is the only side we can be on, amen? Which makes it all the more critical that we discern truth. Politics will always involve spin. We will often be surrounded both at the, the personal and at the global level by people who lust after our stuff who want our money but not our well-being, and they will look to influence our understanding and reduce our power. But God created government, and God does not lie. And that is good news. Can we give God praise? The good news is that a holy God so loved a rebellious world that he sent his only begotten son to live a sinless life die in our place and rise from the grave conquering death and in doing so he paid the price for our sin and gives us a right to everlasting life 
The good news is that the absence of common sovereignty may reign in the world, but as the body of Christ, we can come under the common sovereignty of God. The good news is that alliances can balance power, but God is omnipotent. And the good news is that we can't summon God or place him in charge because we don't even summon Uber Eats at the right time. And we've all had the experience of picking a leader and wishing we could pick again. Selah. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'd like to pray for you. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. If you walked with God and walked away, I'm talking to you too. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. If there is something that you know that you need to do, something that you know you need to release, someone that you know you need to forgive, some, some bondage that you're in that you need to be free of before you can move forward, I'm talking to you too. Just raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to do one simple thing. Come down to this altar so that we, the church, can pray for you together. Let us applaud them. Let us encourage them as they come. Let us recognize that God is moving in this moment. Sometimes the walk from the back of the sanctuary to the front feels like it's a thousand miles and it is our opportunity to pray for people as they are coming. It's our opportunity to pray that hearts would be unlocked, that someone would receive the grace to have the boldness to get out of their seat. The, the first step is often the most painful. It's often the most difficult. Your foot may feel like it weighs a thousand pounds, but all you have to do is take one step and it's one step whether you're coming from the back row of the church or one step whether you have to start a new journey with God whatever it is that you need today beloved there is a one step that you can take there's the next best thing that you can do I'm talking to someone today not just the people at this altar but each and every one of us have something that God is calling us to do and I'm just encouraging you today beloved to take that step for him if that's you today I invite you to come down to this altar as well because the, the altar is the place of exchange and agreement is the place of power and God's presence is the place of freedom so let us come and let us give him praise beloved they're still coming let us continue let us continue to give God praise this is not just the thing that happens at the end of the service. This is the thing that happens at the beginning of someone's next season, at the beginning of someone's new journey, at the beginning of someone's new freedom. When Jesus came, he announced that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him because he had anointed him to, pre to pre spread good news to the poor. Jesus came to set the captives free. He came to open the eyes of the blind. He came to set at liberty those who are oppressed. There is good news in this place today. Can we give God praise? Now, we stand at this altar today and if you're still coming, by all means still come. And to that one person who's thinking that you missed your moment and you're already starting to kick yourself, you can come too. I can't tell you how many times with God I thought I missed the moment. And God in his infinite wisdom and in his matchless grace kept that door open for me. That's the only reason that I stand here today. It's the only reason that so many of us are still standing today. Because God's grace is beyond what we could imagine. God's peace surpasses our ability to understand. So let us praise God and praise him some more. Amen. Now, we stand today with a hundred different burdens, but one almighty God. So whatever decision you are making in this moment, please pray this prayer with me. 
Just holding up a second as I see a few more people coming down the stairs. Praise God for every time we've tried to put a period where God had only put a comma. For every time we thought the door was closed and God is letting someone through the window. Let us pray this prayer together, beloved. Father, thank you for this opportunity to receive your love. I repent of my sin. I believe Christ died on the cross to pay the price for my sin and rose again conquering death. I confess him as Lord and Savior and your word says I'm born again. Thank you for grace and mercy. Thank you that no matter how many times I fall, I can get back up. If I confess, you will wash me clean. Today, I will walk by faith and not by sight. Today, I will lay down my hurts and pick up hope. Today, I will lay down my doubt and pick up faith. Today, I will lay down my will and pick up my cross and follow you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give God praise for good seed and good ground, that his word will never return to him void, that his word is alive in this house. Amen and amen. Family, we believe that if you prayed those prayers, we believe you are born again. We believe you're beginning the process of restoration, the process of, of healing, the process of deliverance, and you're ready to take new steps in the work. But change is not an event, it's a process. So wherever you are in this walk, I need you to do four things. One, study the word. Whether you're beginning or resuming, going deeper, going higher, it is our source of faith and rule of conduct. Two, get in a Bible teaching church. We don't know where God is sending you. We happen to know a church that we like, but wherever you go, find a church that teaches his word. Three, tell someone about the decision that you made today. And four, and this is perhaps most important, keep showing up. Show up here, show up in community, show up for your friends, show up for your family. It's so easy just to stop showing up. Show up because we're better together and it's not the same without you. Now, if you responded to this call by our internet service, we have some information we'd like to give you, so please call or text the number on the screen to you all here and to you all there. May God continue to bless you. Your life will never be the same. And now you may be seated. We have entered into a new season of ministry, beloved, or at least I have. I used to know what to do based on who was here. Now I know what to do based on who is not. Did you get a word today? I want to encourage you as we embark on this next week. This, this week is the, the Super Bowl of our faith. This is Holy Week, so in this Holy, and I just encourage you to trust God to go deeper. This Holy Week, I encourage you to, to, to follow him in understanding holiness. This Passion Week, I encourage you to follow him in, in, in chasing your passion and in understanding what it means to be sold out for a God who gave everything for you. Beloved, please keep praying. I say it every time I have the opportunity to be up here. Prayer changes things. Pray. Pray when you don't know what to do. Pray when you know what to do and you don't want to do it. Pray for grace. The grace to do the impossible. 
Pray for the grace to endure, the grace to persevere. There are people who work our last nerves. There are, there are tasks that we have that, that, that force us to go the extra mile. When you don't think you have anything left, when you just want to take a nap, when you just want to quit, when you just want to leave all these people alone, that is the moment when God shows himself strongest on our behalf because he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is perfected in weakness. So we can it's counterintuitive, but we can come into this place and come wherever we go and we can celebrate and rejoice and proclaim that we are weak, but God is strong. And that's worth something to give God praise for. Amen. <clears throat> Beloved, I look forward to seeing you Friday morning, Friday evening, Sunday morning, whenever we'll see you next. Let us say something good as we leave this place but never God's presence. Jesus is Lord, period. We believe it, we proclaim it, and we're seeing it come to pass. God bless everybody. See you soon. Family, thank you so much for watching CCC's YouTube channel. If you feel what you just experienced impacted your life in any way, we encourage you to like, subscribe, and share this video with others so we can fulfill our mission in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We welcome you to check out some of our other videos. Also, make sure to click the notification bell so you are the first to know when we post a new one. Our praise and worship team brings us a powerful and dynamic live worship experience every Sunday. And trust me and Cameron when I say, you do not want to miss it. Streaming times are in the description box below. And if you are looking for any other information about what's happening here at CCC, visit www.cccinfo.org. We hope to see you next Sunday, but for now, continue to have a blessed week in the Lord.